Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. And um, the mode that I'm on right now, I can't really see any of your faces to kind of see how it's going. And I am going to get a little bit into the science of this. And so I have instructed Glenn that if things go a little too deep on the science or I'm not speaking English uh, in a way that or not making it make sense that he's going to give me feedback on that. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm actually really glad to have this opportunity to kind of give you guys an update on what is happening in the community with the patients who are on LVAD support and trying to get them through to transplant because there's a lot of change in this area. Um, and so um, really glad to be able to take a dedicated you know, lunch hour to really go through it. So um, just a little bit of the outline here, we're just gonna talk a little bit about a history of LVADs because I think that that gives some perspective. We'll talk about the pivot that occurred in the allocation system in 2018 and exactly why that happened and, and what did that entail. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we have seen in the community in terms of a pivot in the practice changes and what this is meaning for various groups on the list, because we're really at a point a couple of years in at this point to say with more certainty what's happening. And then, you know, Glenn just attended I was, it was virtually given, but there was a, a meeting at Heart Failure Society of America where a lot of us heart failure physicians get together. And I posed a survey to the community about how people are feeling about the current allocation system. And I think it was really telling about the results that I got back. And uh, then we'll kind of close with some summary thoughts and you know what we here at the university and our team and you know doctors around the country are doing to try to make sure that things are more fair. Okay, so first off, let's just talk about, you know, if you're on this webinar, you either, you know, maybe you have a transplant and you're interested, or maybe you have an LVAD, you're on the list, or maybe you're considering being listed. You know, one of the problems that we face as heart failure cardiologists is we don't have enough hearts to really go around. Um, as many of you know, in order for us to do a heart transplant, we have to have a pretty young, healthy donor who is brain dead. Um, whose organs are all intact and have it not be very far from where the recipient is going to be. And it's just not something that happens every day. And so we have sort of a graphic here. It's in really small print to see, but you can see, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, you know, there's only about 2,500 or closer to 3,000 now adult heart transplants that happen per year. And as the population ages, it's not as though heart failure is going away. In fact, the prevalence is going up. And so we have a, a large group of patients who would be good candidates for let's, you know, when I talk about advanced therapies, I'm really talking about VADs and transplants, but there's a large group of people who would be great candidates, but not very many to give out per year. And it's not like a kidney or a liver where a kidney people can get by with one or a liver you can get by with part of a liver. A heart, you know, you can't donate that unless you're brain dead. And, um, and so it's a challenge. And many of you know that we're looking at hepatitis C donation um, to try to increase the number of donors. And, and many of you are signed up for the donation after cardiac death trial, which is taking patients who are not quite brain dead, but almost there and putting them on a machine to try to, again, see if we can move the needle on the number of hearts. But it's a problem that we can't really solve. We just don't have enough. And when we think back to you know, the beginning of sort of heart transplantation, part of the reason the LVAD was ever invented at all was to try to make sure that patients weren't in the hospital waiting on temporary, you know, LVADs are more durable pumps that you can go home on. Temporary pumps are ones that people are on in the hospital. And you know, back, you've heard me tell this story, like back in the 1980s and early 90s, we would have patients on temporary machines because there was no LVAD until the right heart became available and the technology sort of moved so far, but LVADs were really invented initially as a bridge to transplant to try to get people out of the hospital, off of the machines, stabilized and in good condition going into transplant with more time to wait at home. That's why the LVAD was initially invented was so that people didn't have to look like this on their way to transplant. And of course, technology got better and better over time. You can see the size comparison of the initial H uh, HeartMate 1, which was also called the XVE. This thing was enormous. And over time, a number of other pumps came to market. Many of you might be supported by HeartMate 2s, uh, which came in around 2008. 
And then there was uh, some of you may have HVADs, and then you know this is the HeartMate 3, which many of you probably have now, or your significant other or, or loved one does. So we've come a long ways in terms of not only the pumps getting smaller, but of course, once the pump started working well enough, we didn't just use them for patients who needed transplants, we started using them for destination therapy for patients who are not classic um, transplant candidates. And you know, we have people go a lot of years. Um, you know, Dr. Maharaj is gonna talk about this, you know, next week, but I have a number of VAD patients who are about 10 or more years of support um, and they're in their mid 80s and it's more of a geriatric clinic at that point because the pump just keeps going. Um, so, you know, these pumps started to work longer and longer. Just to give you some sense, the average duration that an XVE pump lasted was about 14 months before it had to be replaced. And we have some people still going 14 years later on HeartMate 2. And of course, with the HeartMate 3, we only started implanting them in 2015. So it's very hard to know how long they'll go, they'll go but we think we don't have any reason to think they won't go as long as the HeartMate 2. So people can be on VADs for a number of years. Um, before I get into the next slide, we're going to do a little statistical lesson um, in interpreting these curves, which you didn't think that you were signing up for, but I think you guys can totally handle it, and I wouldn't be presenting it if I didn't think you could. Um, so something called Kaplan-Meier curves are ways to sort of look at what's happening to a study population, and so I'm going to show you a few more during this, but this is basically your lesson slide. So when you think about at the beginning of a study, say the outcome is survival, you have 100%, this is percent of people living. At the very beginning of the trial, if you enter a trial, you're basically alive at that point. And then this allows you to kind of visually see what's happening to various groups over time. And so you can see in this at any given time, in this case, it's after transplant, the group in blue has more people surviving in that group than the group in red. And so these are called Kaplan-Meier curves and it really allows kind of a visual look at which groups are doing best. So in this case, again, you have two groups that start out at a certain period of time and then at any given time, the blue group has more survivors. And so you kind of want to be in that blue group, right? So um, this is kind of a summary LVAD history slide and you can see um, back you know, with the uh, something called the rematch trial, this was medical therapy, NOVAD, versus the XVE survival, which was that HeartMate 1. And you can see that the people who got the HeartMate 1 did better than the people who got medical therapy. Again, this was kind of that setup, you know, which group is doing better. And then the HeartMate 2 came along, which is these curves up here. And then the HeartMate 3 came along, which is these curves up here. And just for the whole concept of transplant too, at two years, you can see in the HeartMate 3 trial, they had 79% of people alive at 24 months. That's with the HeartMate 3. And an 82% survival after heart transplant at 24 months, just with more contemporary um, transplant data. This black line here is survival after transplant. And you can see there's kind of an upfront risk that comes with a surgery. And then once you kind of make it through that, patients tend to live. But contemporary survival on an LVAD at two years is rivaling that of heart transplantation. So my point of this is the technology has moved a lot. We are doing better than we've ever done. And um, you know, contemporary survival on a pump at least to two years is rivaling that of heart transplant. What about trends over time? And then Glenn's gonna send me a Mayday signal if I'm getting too sciencey. Um, over the course of the last 10 years, as pumps became better and better and our ability to manage patients on pumps became better, bridge to transplant LVAD use, this is a study we did on, on patients with chemotherapy-associated cardiomyopathy or heart failure. Long, This is a busy slide, but you can see from 2008 to 2018, bridge to transplant VAD use, you know, at the time of transplant in 2008, you had 24% of patients had a VAD inside their body at the time of transplant. This is national data. And by the time 2018 rolls around, 50% of people who got a transplant were on a VAD at the time that they got it. So over this time, survival on the wait list improved because people were put on VADs. And also the use of VADs on the way to transplant was increasing like this over time. 
So then comes 2018, when all of this kind of came to a screeching halt. And I'll tell you, this is a busy slide, but I think you guys can handle this too, because many of you know, I was this status before and I'm this status now. So what happened in 2018? So if you guys remember, and many people, you know, Glenn Kelly remembers, a number of people kind of remember what their status was. So prior to 2018, we had three tiers, 1A, 1B, and status two. If you had an LVAD, the really only way that you could be 1A was to have a complication, or we used to allow 30 days of, of 1A time periodically, or you were sitting at home without a complication and you were a 1B. 1A also encompassed people who were critically ill on forms of temporary support in the hospital with, and we have some patients whose physiology a VAD won't support. So, you know, you would have these people in the hospital on say one of our kinds of temporary support, like you guys have maybe heard of ECMO or balloon pumps or impellas. These are all versions of temporary support. We would have patients who really didn't have an LVAD option because their heart, it wasn't the right fit for them who had no other option, maybe they were young, and they would be a status 1A. And then you would have somebody at home with possibly a driveline infection on some antibiotics, but possibly working from home, and they were the exact same status. And if you remember, that was such a crowded space that it took a really long time of 1A status before you could actually get your transplant, depending on your blood group. And so everyone felt like there needed to be further stratification of the 1As to allow people to make it through to transplant more quickly and to be able to really assign acuity within that list. And so what happened was you, you know, the old 1A really got parsed out into status one being ECMO, which is our sickest, sickest patients on temporary support. Status two is other versions of temporary support. And again, durable support is like an LVAD. You can go home with that temporary support to go through in a few more slides are different kinds of machines that we can put people in with different levels of support that they provide. And ECMO is basically like being on a heart lung machine and nobody really wants that. But status one is ECMO. Status two is other types of temporary support. And status three is basically you are on two infusions or you have an LVAD complication. And status four is I'm home either on a single infusion or I have a VAD in my body and no complications are happening. And so everyone thought, okay, this looks great. Let's roll this out and see what happens. You know, we wanted, there were also a couple of nuanced changes that happened in terms of um, us being able to have access to young hearts in Chicago for a very, very sick patients in status one, two. So there was kind of more geographic sharing. But the general concept was, is let's create further stratification at the top to try to reduce weightless mortality and to try to get some of those sickest sick people to transplant. And right away, um, overall, you can see that wait times at old 1A status was 59 days. And basically the equivalent now was down to 12 days. And so the, the further stratification worked, you know, the status ones and twos have very short status ones were waiting five days. This is kind of initial status two, nine days. I mean, remember back in the old days with 1A, you would have to park in house for a couple months before you'd even get a call um, or a donor would come up for you. So suddenly these top tier statuses started to move through very quickly. Um, but what happened in the field is that the use of temporary support started to drive up in response to this. And I'll show you just a slide of ECMO. So ECMO is a version of temporary support. And in the red is over years, you can see that you know, ECMO as using as a bridge to transplant was very, very, very low levels all the way 20, 2006 making up you know, 0.6% of transplants. And all of a sudden you have the allocation shift and suddenly ECMO uses up to 4.9%, which doesn't seem like a large share of the pie of transplants, but definitely sicker patients that have ever been through and also way more ECMO use. So temporary support use went up quite a bit. Um, I've said these sort of out loud, but for, for temporary support types that support the left ventricle, you really have the thing called balloon pump, which many of you are sort of for, familiar with. Um, it's, it's, it's a sort of a lighter amount of support for the heart versus an impella, which is a pump that's placed from the inside, sucking blood from the left ventricle out to the aorta. But you don't go home with it. This provides more support. And then VA ECMO is basically people being totally, this is people who are 
on breathing tubes with huge hoses coming out of their abdomen or out of their leg. This is not a place where we like to park people a long time because the risk of stroke and bleeding and loss of limb is so high or infection that could lead to non-candidacy is high enough. This is kind of a dangerous spot to sit. But um, when you look overall, uh, this is a slice kind of one year before the allocation shift to after use of ECMO, we went from 1.7% of transplants up to 7.6% of transplants. Balloon pumps were used as a bridge to transplant 13.8% before in the year after the allocation shift up to 39%. The year before um, the allocation shift, 78% of patients were bridged on beds and suddenly we were down to 46%. And so you can see there's this massive shift towards more temporary support and less LVAD use. And if you look kind of over time, um, this is a little bit of a confusing slide. And as you would imagine it, a lot of the transplants are going to the status one is this dark blue, status uh, two is a sort of darker shade blue, and then the lighter shade blue is status three. You have like the 54% kind of going to these top tier strata. And I'll talk about this more in a minute, but I don't think what anyone really anticipated when this happened was that as more and more teams use status one and two, it takes longer and longer times to get through and hearts are not trickling down to the three and the fours. And there's always another status one or two that will always go ahead of the three or fours where not as many hearts are trickling down to the three and four status, um, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, the one-year survival um, after transplant, again, you guys are now professionals at looking at Kaplan-Meier curves. This is kind of a magged up view of post-transplant survival in an, a slice kind of a couple years before the allocation shift and to after. Overall, out to a year, we have about a 90% survival um, in both eras or a little greater than 91 and 91.5. So we're doing, despite the fact that we're doing sicker patients, we seem to be doing about, uh, about the same in terms of post-transplant survival. So what has been the LVAD story? I've already alluded to the fact that we were, we use, VAD technology was moving, we were getting better and better, the VADs are getting smaller, more durable, and then bridge to transplant VAD use was going like this the whole time. And then all of a sudden 2018 happens, and you can see as um, for patients who are listed for transplant, you have this moment in time starting in 2018, where all of a sudden the VADs at the time of listing go down, 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 because doctors realize that the VADs are not, part of what's happening with physicians right now is physicians are realizing that their VAD patients are not climbing to the top of the list without multiple, sometimes one or more complications. And so there's a reluctance on the physician part to place the VADs right now, because we know that the way through to transplant is paved with complications. And if you have a VAD complication, you're only a status three and you will always be passed by a status two. And so VAD use among physicians to get people to transplant has gone down. That's this light blue line. And we're also not doing quite as well. Here's yet another Kaplan some, uh, Meyer survival curve. In the prior system, VAD patients had a survival after transplant in the blue line, and the red line is the post-transplant survival after you have a VAD in your body and you get to transplant now, which is a little worse, which I think, in which I just did an analysis this morning, is largely driven by the fact that the patients that are getting through to transplant now are having more complications, and there's been this shift. It used to be if you had a lot of life-threatening complications on your VAD, you might not have made it to transplant, and I think those patients are making it through now, which is impacting results. So, you know, in summary, kind of a little part summary here. So we have shorter wait times, we have further stratification in the new system, post-transplant survival appears similar, temporary support use is way up, and um, that's also, I haven't shown this data to you guys, but the patients who are waiting on ECMO and other forms of temporary support, there's a downside to this too. They have the um, they have the highest. Um, Glenn, I might run out of battery on my computer. Hold on, I'm going to text my husband to bring. <laughs> I thought I had enough juice. Hold on a second. Let's call for reinforcement. If I could interject, I think yep. this is one of those times where 
um, you could probably use an extra LVAD battery. Because <laughs> nobody on this call lets their LVAD batteries get to <laughs> Yeah, where is it? You guys are going to have to... Um... You can learn something. You're about, you're about to. You're about to. You're about to witness <laughs> like a husband. Okay. So in any case, um, right. So basically, I have to say, there is a risk in waiting on temporary support to get to transplant. It's not just five days that we're putting people on balloon pumps or other forms of temporary support. Those patients in the ICU are we're risking infection and stroke and other problems and among the waitlist strategies to try to get people to transplant, putting people on temporary support and waiting and crossing our fingers turns out to have the highest mortality among waitlist strategies. And so, you know, my point is that that pathway may be straight through to transplant, but there's risk in doing that. We have reinforcements here. Thank you. Sorry about the webinar. Okay. While she's doing that, I'll, I'll make a mention. If you if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, you can, there's a chat function. You can hit the conversation in the upper right hand corner of your uh, screen. There, uh, a little bubble. Um, in fact, I'll just put a note in here. Hello, and free to ask questions. And so, and I know you know Glenn always makes sure that they have some sort of. <laughs> person to provide emotional support whenever I'm in this, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys the facts as I see them right now, but I also want to let you know, we are doing something about this. Okay. So we're not just, we have enough data now to really know what's happening. And my next part is going to be to tell you what I'm going to do about it. So, you know, I think as physicians, again, we realize there's this constant influx of status one and two, and all as the use of those top tier strata continues, it gets more crowded, wait times go longer, and then you have physicians kind of holding out before placing the VAD because we know the VADs aren't making it through, and so you have this kind of balancing of risks. So I was scheduled to give this talk at Heart Failure Society of America, and I feel like during the pandemic, this couldn't have happened at a worse time. We had this huge shift in the way that hearts are allocated, and then normally we are at these meetings, we're talking to each other, et cetera, and then COVID happens, and we all kind of just closed into our centers. And I, there's been a lot published about this, but I, I really wanted to take the temperature of the providers, both the surgeons and the cardiologists in the field to say, in the United States, how are you guys feeling about the allocation system? Because there are people who made the allocation system who may feel like you need more time to see how this settles out. And then there are a lot of us on the ground saying, this doesn't feel fair. There are groups that are not working out okay. And so, you know, I wanted to really ask the community how people were feeling about it. So, um, so here's kind of what the, so I ran a survey, I posted it on Twitter, I piloted it internally, and then um, the survey went out. It was a 12 question survey. I'm going to show a couple of the responses here. And we had 100 and it's actually now 120, but 117 responding, largely made up of heart failure cardiologists at 88% versus about 12% surgeons like Dr. John and Dr. Schaefer. And the question, I believe the allocation system for heart transplant instituted in 2018 requires modification. 94% of respondents agreed that we needed to pivot. Um, answering the question, my team is utilizing more temporary support than before the change to achieve higher allocation status. 84% agreed with that statement. If there was a more reliable pathway for VAD patients to receive a transplant, I'd be more willing to place an LVAD as bridge therapy. About 84% agree with that. I am concerned about the pattern and change of physician behavior and practices to achieve transplant under the new system. 85% said yes. And there was a write-in component uh, that I took to sort of see what the community would want to do about this. I have to tell you guys, the overwhelming amount of write-in responses had to do with the LVADs not getting a fair shake in the new system. Many good ideas were put in there, meaning if you had been on your LVAD for more than two years, perhaps you should be an automatic status three. If you have an LVAD complication, you should be a status two. They talked about using elective status two time instead of status three, so you'd get a real shot at this. Others talked about taking balloon pumps out of status two 
and really limiting the top tier strata to people who have ex real exceptions to LVADs, meaning that both their ventricles don't work or they have a type of physiology like a small stiff heart where a VAD won't work, and also to regulate the use of the exception statements. I can tell you because um, I'm talking to a number in the community about this, that there is a thought of beginning to create something called a heart allocation score in 2023. Um, and the idea there, uh, and we're going to advocate hard, that time on LVAD should count for points. And dialysis did this, right? So for renal transplantation, if you've been on dialysis for a period of time, that counts, meaning in, in a very similar equivalent is what is happening to the VADs. There's also discussion of having points for race, points for having very high levels of antibodies, uh, perhaps more points for being blood group O, and really points for patient acuity and not what device is in place in their body. And so I actually, we took this survey results and we are publishing it. Um, we're so we, it's all done, all ready to go, and it's getting submitted to the Journal of Heart Lung Transplant as a brief communication because I think this will foster discussion within the community Yes, there are thoughts to be able to try to change the allocation system in 2023, 20, but that is going to take modeling, public comment. We don't move very quickly towards change in this field, but I'm hoping that this, you know, that this fosters a discussion in the community about some changes that we can make even within the existing system towards more fairness. Um, let's see. What else was I going to go through with you guys? Um, oh, and then just other things. You know, Dr. Dr. Martin is on the um, heart committee, and I'm applying to be on the heart committee. And I, I think um, some some people have encouraged me to do that. That's the sort of allocation system heart committee. You know, I hope that my advocacy for the bad community and also just my stats background, et cetera, I'm hoping to be able to use that influence um, towards making a more equitable system. Do you want me to stop sharing that, Glenn? Oh, uh, I didn't know. Oh, you had a summary. Yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, so that's basically, I mean, long story short for you guys, VADs have come a long way. I've already said it. Bridge to transplant VAD use was up like this, and now it's down like this because physicians see that it's very hard for the VAD patients to get through. It's not fair to everyone who's been sitting on their VAD, hoping they would get a transplant years before, and we are working on it. Um, it's kind of a long story short. And I know I got pretty into the weeds on some of the data there, but I know you guys, are, I know you guys can handle it and nobody knows VADs. And for those who are listed, the whole status piece better than you guys. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I, I really do want this to be a dialogue. Um, I'm certainly open for questions and happy to answer anything. And I know that Glenn had asked me this yesterday. He was worried that, um, he was worried that perhaps some bad patients would try to think that getting a complication would help them get through to transplant. Um, please don't, please don't do that. Um, most patients with VADs out there and especially your underlying heart function is so poor that if something, you know, acutely happens to the VAD, it could be extremely dangerous. Um, so thought I would, I'm going to stop sharing there. Did I stop sharing? Yes. Okay. And uh, OK. All right. And then uh, uh, your camera is, if you want to click your camera off, and then Brian will spotlight over to you. Um, was, there you are. OK. Is my all, camera off the whole time? Yeah, but that's OK. We saw the slides, and we're, it's, it's one of the functions of Teams. Oh, OK. So, so anyway. Yes, Hi, uh, she dressed up for everybody just for the record. So, yes, thank you. Um, you know, those are it's a lot of information there. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, uh, but I, I know personally I'm going to go back and kind of watch the recording to really digest what she had to say, uh, because if you're like me, anytime I have an appointment with her, um, I, I feel like I've talked about more content in, in the shortest amount of time humanly possible. So it takes me three or four days to digest everything that was talked about within 30 minutes. And I think <laughs> this presentation was a great example of that. So thank you. Meaning we really got a lot of value there and a bang for our buck. Um, 
And that said, if you do have questions, feel free to put those into the into the in the message queue here, and we'll handle theirs to the end. Uh, to move things along, I want to hand things over to Brian, Dr. Brian Roscoe, who's also at uh, the U of M uh, Medical Center, part of M Health Fairview, uh, talking about okay, how to deal with some of this uncertainty. Um, so, um, you know, if if uh, uh, Rebecca was almost like the straight person, you know, it's, it leads to Brian and what can you personally do, uh, you know, uh, about this and how do you feel about this and so forth. So, Brian, let me hand it off to you and uh, feel free to take it away. All right. Uh, let me just check to see if everyone can see my screen. Can you see the slides? OK. Yes. And Brian, you may want to try the same trick uh, Rebecca did and just put that little arrow on the upper right there where your cursor is, and you'll get us a little more screen space. There you go. That's great. Take Wonderful. It okay. Well, um, appreciate the the transition there, there, Glenn. Um, so let me just kind of briefly and formally introduce myself. So again, I'm I'm Dr. Brian Roscoe, one of the health psychologists that works at the clinics and surgery center. I've been with Fairview now for supporting our um, LVAD and solid organ transplant team for the last two years or so. And what I really wanted to do is kind of transition from what Dr. Cogswell spoke to about some of these kind of allocation changes and really how that I think breeds a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of people's health and their prognosis and what the kind of things they can do. And, and we know that uncertainty is something that my brain just really inherently dislikes. Um, we know that our brain likes to fill in gaps in information in any way that it can, and uncertainty can be really challenging to, to cope with. And the transplant process, not to mention the LVAD process, can impose a lot of that. Um, and that's where I really wanted to kind of speak to today. So just a couple goals that I wanted to go over today. Uh, really, I wanted to spend a really brief amount of time going over the mental health implications of all this, right? Allocation changes, living with LVAD, transplant processes, what can that really uh, affect somebody? How can that affect somebody? And really just to kind of do that to give some implications about you're not alone, right? You've been there. A lot of people are kind of experiencing these similar challenges or mental health difficulties. The meat and potatoes of really what I want to get through today is really have people kind of have a couple takeaways of some coping skills to kind of help adjust to LVAD or some uncertainty that they're going through to kind of transition from what Dr. Coxwell was speaking to. And then lastly, this is a really challenging issue in that connecting with mental health care is really hard right now. Um, the pandemic has put a lot of tax on our ability to connect with mental health care providers. So what I wanted to do is just end on what are some kind of concrete steps that you can take if you're interested in talking to somebody, getting a little bit of extra support. It's really hard to do that. So I wanted just to kind of talk a little bit about ways that you could do that or connect with a mental health professional, um, some insider information, if you will. Um, so just kind of to transition here to talk a little bit about the landscape of common mental health experiences of uh, contending with LVAD and transplant. Um, as Dr. Cogswell had mentioned, quality of life can really improve with LVAD, um, though we do want to kind of be careful and say mental health difficulties are extremely common uh, before and after implant. In fact, we have some data that really supports that distress can vary across the LVAD treatment. However, we see that spikes in mental health symptoms, particularly anxiety and depression, can happen just before implantation of, of, the, of the LVAD unit and the device and months after implant. We see a bit of a dip in relief just immediately following implant, meaning people generally kind of feel a little bit anxious or worried about the device being implanted. Um, but then once after a few months after implant that some of those mental health symptoms can return after that a relief of the implant being kind of going over so really i just wanted to share this as like you are not alone right a lot of these common experiences of anxiety depressed mood anxious thoughts adjustment related difficulties are extremely common um and in fact when they kind of did a little bit of literature review i wanted to just kind of break down some of my observations both from clinical experience and what research is showing so device related distress is one of the most common things that we can see um, when we transition to long term outpatient care. So that's concerned related to is my device working properly? Am I getting these bodily signals that feel kind of concerning to me? Do they signal some danger or harm? 
we do also see, and this is due to the pandemic as well, a big change in how we think of how we connect with others. So we also see that rates of loneliness, isolation, um, some of those other feelings can really persist with that as well. Really what I broke down in terms of those concerns are both kind of internal concerns, things that kind of exist within us and external concerns. So I break this down to things that are kind of underneath my skin and things about outside my skin, so to speak. Internal concerns really can boil down to when we work with people in mental health is worry about bodily signals, as I mentioned, device malfunctions, memory and focus troubles are very common, lack of energy and some identity changes. You know, essentially kind of asking that question is who am I now, now that I'm, I have this implant and going through the transplant process. External concerns, things that kind of exist outside my skin, those can be things such as worry about relationships, social interactions, finances, intimacy concerns are also very common. Um, changes to family rules and dynamics are also things that we work with in the counseling perspective. Uh, so the first part, I really want to kind of talk about worry and anxiety first. We see that worry and anxiety uh, tend to go really hand in hand, something that's extremely common as people kind of go through the transplant or LVAD process. And yet, I, I when I work with people, one thing I like to mention is that anxiety in a lot of ways is not our enemy. Meaning when we anxiety is there by design, kind of like a fever in our body, the fever, while it's really unpleasant, we're, we naturally kind of have fevers, right, to kind of help protect us against various things. But anxiety is really our body's way of sending us a signal that we might be potentially in danger of something. When we evolved over the course of time, unfortunately, our mind never evolved for really good mental health. But what it was evolved to do was to protect itself from harm. And our body does such a really good job of that, but sometimes it does a too good of a job, meaning we can sometimes be really uncomfortable, we can be in distress, we have maybe a hard time not thinking about our experiences or our problems. So when we talk about counseling, our goal is not necessarily to get rid of our anxiety. In fact, we would never want to do that because some level of anxiety is going to be important, right? It helps us be conscientious, take care of ourselves, do a lot of those things. And yet anxiety can become problematic. And these are just a few signs that I like for people to kind of look out for and saying, is it worth me talking to somebody about my anxiety? So things to just kind of look out for, am I worrying kind of most days of the week, most of the time during the day? Does the worry ever get in the way of things I'm trying to do or trying things that I find enjoyable? So that would include things like spending time with family, hobbies, interests, important things to you. Often feeling keyed up or restless and fatiguing easily due to worry itself. So do we ever feel like we're worrying so often or feeling anxious as often that we feel really tired? Anxiety depletes a lot of mental resources um, to make us feel pretty fatigued and uh, tired a good deal of the time. As you might imagine, uh, people can have trouble sleeping because of racing thoughts or worry. And irritability, lastly, is one of those things that's kind of those hidden mental health symptoms. We don't often talk about irritability as a sign for other things but we know irritability can actually be a symptom of feeling anxious or keyed up or stressed. Um, so these are some signs that I kind of recommend people just to kind of pay attention to. Is, is this something that I'm experiencing? Things. Doctor about that and getting help connected with services, but more on that later. So kind of the big question is how do we manage our worry to become in more of a tolerable level? And these are some strategies that I hope the audience today can kind of take away as maybe being two to three things that they can concretely do today to maybe help manage some of that anxiety that can come from some of the uncertainty that we're facing right now. And what I find interesting is the first thing that I recommend for people is to really designate some worry time each day for about 15 to 20 minutes. Worry time is an evidence-based therapy that has been shown to help people manage their worry more effectively. And the idea behind it is to allocate a little bit of time each day where we can find ourselves letting ourselves worry about whatever it is that's presently bothering us. Um, and I'll have an example of this on the next slide. But what this does is helps kind of contain the worry in a more structured way. 
And if we find ourselves worrying about outside of our designated worry time, we can use some kind of self-talk to say, you know what, I'm going to try and worry about that at five o'clock today or from five to five twenty. And that's a strategy that we refer to as delayed worry. And what we find is that when people utilize some of that skill, because they're allowing their mind to kind of do what it's naturally designed to do, but in a more structured way, they're, they feel as though they're able to manage their worry more effectively. Um, so this is actually a very robust version of journaling. It's a little bit more uh, structured and can be shown to be helpful with that. Anxiety also tends to be responsive to behavioral strategies. So what I like to call forgetting it's their therapies. So forgetting it's their therapies when it comes to device related distress are activities and behaviors that you find valuable, meaningful and enjoyable. And the more likely we are to engage in those kind of activities or having a forgetting it's their kind of experience, even though they're a bit brief can help with good coping for handling some of the uncertainty of things that we're going through. In fact, I often encourage patients to focus on things they can control when they're faced with a really uncertain time, right? I have control over uh, who I spend my time with, how I talk to people, how vulnerable I can be with others in my life, and or how I cope with some of that uncertainty and shifting our kind of language to, well, what can I do about this anxiety or this challenge in this moment to find ways to relax or find calm can be helpful. That actually utilizes a part of our brain, uh, the frontal lobe, which kind of evolved over time to help kind of correct some of that anxious distress that can come up from that. Of course, incorporation of relaxation and mindfulness is gonna be really important as well, just that last point there. Um, doing things that we find relaxing and building our focus on more of the present moment is going to be really important. In general, we see that when people feel anxious, their mindset tends to gravitate towards the future. What's going to happen to me a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. And what we see is that the proportionality of our anxiety to the length of time we're seeing things in the future tends to be directly related to each other. Meaning the further out my thoughts go, the more anxious I tend to feel. And so mindfulness is gonna be a really key part of sometimes treatment in that how do I build awareness of the present moment, the here and now? And really that incorporates hobbies and interests, relaxation, meditation, and mindfulness, all those kind of good skills you may have heard of. This is an example of a worry log that I use with patients quite often. Um, and you'll be able to kind of see these slides, I think on the website later, so you can kind of borrow this. But the, the basic premise is, is really taking some time, again, 15 to 20 minutes, where you allow yourself to kind of let yourself worry about what is it that bothering you? So I included an example here, right? Um, this is an example that I borrowed from a, a patient from a couple of years, about a year ago. Um, they had said during that, I'm really worried about going to the cabin this weekend, right? Very Minnesota thing to, to kind of worry about. Um, if I go, I won't be near any hospitals and something bad will happen or would happen. And what I had this patient do is kind of, okay, I want you to rate how much that thought makes you feel anxious, right? How, what's the initial intensity? And I usually, I use a very simple, you know, zero to 10 scale, zero being not at all anxious, 10 being very panicky, very anxious, like feelings. And they had rated it about a seven out of 10. So pretty anxious. And the thought made them feel pretty pretty upset this next part we often have worries and worries kind of feel like they're racing thoughts I and mean, we have a lot of them at any time and it feels really disorganized is what a lot of people say and one thing that i help people do is categorizing your worries and thoughts can help feel like they're containing it so i want you to imagine like you have this filing folder filing cabinet and you have all these files all over the floor right and those files are kind of like our worries categorizing our worries and thoughts is kind of like taking those files and putting them back into the filing folder. They're still there and they still can be distressful, but they feel more contained or feel like we're making sense of what I'm worried about. So for them, they had said that that feels like a health concern. I'm worried I'm not gonna be able to get the help that I need. With the help of a therapist, you could kind of help identify, are there any thinking errors present in my mind? We all do this. We all have really quick judgments or thoughts about things especially when it comes to safety concerns. And so this isn't something that means you're thinking wrong or thinking in a bad way. It just means your brain, again, is doing what it's designed to do. But we can start to notice 
those kind of thought patterns. So for her, we had thought about, this is jumping to conclusions and thinking in more catastrophic terms. When we think in catastrophic terms or catastrophic thoughts, we tend to have a spike in anxiety or anxious distress. What some people do was also try and think of an alternative to their worrisome thought during their worry log. So for example, they might say, I've been stable with my LVAD for several months now. It's good to be cautious, right? We wanna to respond to the anxiety in a kind way, but a catastrophe is not likely to happen. And so we, we rate the intensity of that now after thinking differently, and they had rated it a, a four out of 10. So as you can see, the, the anxiety doesn't go away, but a four out of 10 versus a seven out of 10 is more manageable, right? It's less intrusive, it's less bothersome in the day to day. So that's an example of a worry lock that um, can be helpful. Um, and again, kind of going through these motions a couple for a designated period of time of day can be helpful. Um, a lot of people when it comes to LVAD and going through cardiovascular treatment report that they have some distress when it comes to managing some of those bodily signals, heart palpitations, um, other physical manifestations of cardiovascular difficulties. And the one way that I kind of help people think about this is when they have that anxious distress, it's kind of like that lousy car you had at one point in your life, right? That one lousy car, when you drove it, maybe you bump, went over a bump and your check engine light came on. That check engine light is trying to tell you something, right? It's trying to tell you that, hey, there's something not working here. There's something that could be potentially dangerous if I continue to drive my car. But what some patients can do is they can kind of bring their car or themselves into the doctor quite often and say, I'm having this symptom, I'm having this experience. And they kind of notice, okay, the doctor ran some tests, but things are things are stable, things are okay. Then they get home and that check engine light kind of comes back on. They hit another bump, light signal kind of comes on. And what they do is they kind of continue to go back and they kind of find themselves thinking a lot about that check engine light, right? That bodily signal. And what that does is kind of creates a bit of this cycle of kind of monitoring symptoms. And it's important to pay attention to those symptoms. We don't want to necessarily ignore them, but it's more about noticing are the as symptoms kind of trying to get my behavior to change in some way? Am I trying to get me to do something? And is me doing that action or that behavior contributing to my mental distress in some way? And so what we do in therapy, and this is a very abbreviated version of this, but we, what we try to do is kind of say, okay, let's notice that check engine light and how do we cope with it? What are ways that we can watch our thinking, our feelings, and our behavior to cope more effectively? And for some people that might mean, okay, I'm noticing that signal, that heart palpitation, that flutter. I know if I think my way through it or tell myself this usually passes or this will be okay. And if it doesn't, then I might be able to call my doctor or help kind of get the help that I need, for example. That can be a way that we can kind of help manage some of those those symptoms. I'm gonna kind of breeze through here because I know we're getting close on on time, but I do want to kind of touch on depression really quick because we do know that depression is uh, extremely common. Um, depression, and that's kind of a gross analogy, but I, I do think it kind of helps talk about it when it comes to transplant and LVAD is depression is a little bit like bacteria. It requires certain conditions in order to persist, right? It needs the right food to eat, the right temperature, the right environment in order for it to persist. The good news about that is if we change some of the factors, we often change the depression or like bacteria, it doesn't survive. And in general, what we see when we kind of manage depressed mood, which is different than sometimes just clinical depression, meaning some people will experience depressed mood when they face something stressful. That's, that's not uncommon. So I want to be careful and see when you see this, depressed mood is different than clinical depression when you see this, because that's very common. But generally those factors that we want to look for are activity, social contact, diet, sleep, and thought patterns. Those are typically the factors when you meet with a counselor are going to kind of help you manage or look at, right? And what we do is we try and develop goals around those factors for kind of help manage mood. We don't have to address all of them, but generally if you pick a couple of those to kind of help manage the areas that are affected for you the most, 
we generally see some some good outcomes with managing some of those symptoms. Like I mentioned with anxiety, it's good to recognize, okay, when is the depression might be something that I need some greater help with? Um, this is just kind of your own radar system that if you're ever kind of thinking about how am I doing? How am I feeling in the context of these things I'm going through? These are some things I might recommend you look out for. So there's physical, right? Do I feel tired? Do I have aches and pains? Did my appetite change? Because of how I'm feeling emotionally. We know that these physical changes can manifest because of cardiovascular or other physical medical issues. And yet, if do you ever feel tired or achy just because I feel like emotionally exhausted, I feel depleted, I don't feel like I have interest in anything. Those are some things to look out for. Behavioral is what we do. Does my action change? Does my behavior look differently when I feel this way? Am I doing less? Am I sleeping more? Am I withdrawing socially? Thoughts, right? How does my mind look like? Am I thinking negatively? Do I have trouble focusing? And emotional is probably one of the hallmarks, right, that we might see, usually the most uh, prevalent for people, and they, they can, these things stand out. Sadness, anger, guilt, despair. Right, so these are things that we would say, if we have a combination of these things, it's we're always worth talking to your doctor about. I'm having these experiences. These are common. They're always worth kind of getting some extra help with. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? I want to, um, and you realize we're at the one o'clock hour. Do we feel good for a few extra minutes or do we want to? If you can, yeah, if you can wrap up pretty quickly here. Yeah. And we've got a couple That's... of questions we want to address as well. Looks yes. Like. Um, you know what, I'm going to reserve um, what we have left on here. It's just kind of ways to kind of help develop these goals. So that what we call SMART goals. This is pretty self-explanatory stuff. Um, this is an example of a depression care log. This is something you might develop with a counselor. And really it's about building in some of those good coping skills based on what we talked about before. So for example, if you were to work with a therapist to help manage mood, you might do a little bit of walking have some social contact, work on things with diet um, and exercise, working on things with our sleep and helping manage our, our thinking. Um, Time-based pacing, we won't have time to get into today, but this is just how we pace our energy levels a little bit more effectively. Um, you'll see in my slides here, if you were to access this online, um, these are some really just simple tools to kind of help with pacing out our energy throughout the day to engage in valued activity more effectively. Um, as opposed to kind of how some people kind of try and push through um, some of those things. Um, so you'll see all the kind of tips for successful pacing here. Again, I would encourage just kind of going on the website to kind of review some of these things, um, to kind of look at how to kind of effectively do this. And then lastly, connecting with mental health care. I didn't get a chance to kind of touch on this, but it is really hard. I always, always say, start with your primary doctor. Be open about how you're feeling. Um, even if you're not sure if what I'm feeling is concerning or worth further intervention, it's always worth just asking. And they can connect you with somebody like myself. And, you know, we can just have an initial meeting just to chat. How are things going? And, you know, your mental health provider from there can uh, make a referral or help you get connected. Um, I always say fit with your therapist is important. It's okay to shop around a little bit. I tell people to fire me at any time if they don't feel like I'm a good fit for them. Um, we know that fit with a therapist is really important. And psychologytoday.com, it's just a great way to gauge availability of therapist in your area for an online resource. Um, and with that, you know, I kind of breezed through that last little bit there, but uh, I want to kind of give right. some time for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, Brian. Well, thank you. That's very informative. And uh, for those on uh, know that uh, his slides in their entirety will be posted with the recording of this afterwards. So uh, I know he's got excellent reference material there that he didn't get to spend the time on here, but you can actually go back and take a look at those later. Uh, I'm going to do a quick segue over a Q&A. There's a couple of really good questions out there. And um, one is going to be a two-parter, perhaps, in fact. But I would do want to lead off with the one, um, Dr. Cogswell, if you would go ahead and, you know, the question about, you know, uh, aging uh, VAD patients. Um, and I'll leave that to you. And you're on mute. 
We all do it. Thanks. No. There we go. Yes. I think at this point with uh, we'd, we'd have that down, but not necessarily. <laughs> um, so I would say the concept, the question really comes around to, we have some patients who are getting closer to the classic cut point of 70. And as you know, in our program for kind of new evaluations, if somebody's 70, by the time they reach us, we're not really considering a transplant, but for some of our patients who are really fit and healthy and otherwise good candidates who don't have a lot of other medical problems, you know, we will consider extending sometimes to 71 if you're already listed. Um, the question really comes down to if there is some sort of more points for LVAD in some way to try to make VADs more fair, will we, will we take into consideration the fact that people are older um, and close to aging out? I don't think so. And part of the reason for that is, um, Ross, if you look at you know, we know that age is just a number, but you know, that age 65 to 70, you know, like to put this into perspective, historically Mayo hasn't even offered transplant past 65. You know, so once you sort of get, you know, definitely and well selected, the, the number of transplant patients sort of that are over 70 is very low, but they exist. Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes when people are sort of 68, 69 and kind of doing well on their VAD, we sort of wonder whether that's maybe even the right thing to do. And we, we do it because we know that the patients really want it. And the transplant is kind of this dream that people are hanging on to. I don't want to have my co cable anymore. I want to be at the second chance for life barbecue and be one of these transplant patients who look so good. I want that so bad. But, you know, the older you are when you get your transplant, the more likely you are to have complications, the more likely you are to have infections. Um, and secondary cancers. And, you know, sometimes I've actually wondered when I've transplanted somebody at 68, 69, 70, who was perfectly stable on their VAD, whether I did the right thing, because we then invited a lot of other complications in. Again, so not to say we don't have great patients who are fit and looking well, who would do likely very well with transplant, but I think it has to be the right person and the community on, as a whole, as we get closer to 70, we start to feel reasonably nervous about transplanting at that age because we know all of the rest that can come with it. So it's not like you're gonna get more points for being older. You're likely to get more points for being younger. Yeah, and uh, complications on the back end, I, I'm a poster child for that and I'm young. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. lost we've we've lost some patients even in the first we've we've lost some pretty steady VADs who went on to transplant and wondered. You know, we always go forth. You know, it, it's so hard to know because I I think once you're into, you know, so many of our VAD patients wouldn't have it any other way and live their life and have a good quality of life on their VAD and others are just really viewing every single day as that's their way to transplant. I'm so done with this and I'm ready to not have this. Like I'll take any risk and everything in between. But I do think, and it's easy for me to say because I'm not sitting there on my VAD with the allocation system where it is right now, which is reducing a lot of hope, but I, we're working on it and you know, we just have to attempt the, the best that we can to sort of live every day. You know, and part of the whole thing too is you know, time on the earth, right? So if I transplant somebody you know, who's 25 years old, our average expectancy after that is about 13 years. If I have six or seven years on a VAD and then I tack on 13 on the end with a transplant, that's longer time on the earth than if I had transplanted them up front. And that's some of the stuff that we're balancing as well. Yeah, that actually is, is a good lead in. Um, and Ross, thank you for a couple of very poignant questions. Uh, the second one, you know, for and, and this I think actually could be viewed as two parts, one for each of you. And that is, so patients that are bridged to transplant, you know, there's anxiety about leaving town. Go see the grandkids, right? Go live. And yet, are you available if you get the phone call? Uh, right? And so there's a reality of that. And there's like, there's the, how do you feel it? So let's take it in two parts or back to going to lead and Brian, I, you take that. Yeah. I am super towards the live your life. I am super towards the go, you know, yes, we have to have the phone. And trust me, I will hunt you down when the transplant call for you. I have sent people to knock on doors if the cell phone was off in the middle of the night with the police. I'm not joking. Um, I will find you if your heart comes up. And also we have a lot of time. Remember we have, you know, I think, I think part of it is, you know, and you can talk to the transplant coordinators, et cetera. I've had patients, you know, go to California, see the kids come back. Like you got to live your life while the, you know, cause we don't know what's going to happen. And so I think, 
you know, and within the region, we have patients that we transplant who are, you know, on the Canadian border that we airlift down in the time that the transplant happens. And there's a lot of time to get back. I'm just going to be honest with you because, you know, the the donor uh, process takes a really long time usually. And so if you get the call, it's not like you've got to be there 15 minutes later and you're going under, it's usually the next day. So I, you know, if you're seriously going to California or Europe or something, I would say just do it and we will deal with the listing piece. Sometimes we have a little bench part, we'll put you right back on. I think just live your life because none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. And jumping on top of that too, you know, one of the main goals of all this is quality of life. Totally. And and quality of life is not just on a physical end, but also our emotional end. And the way we look at it is maximizing the number of moments where we kind of say, I'm I'm having quality of life. I'm feeling good about the life that I'm living. And to Dr. Cogswell's point, you have to live your life in order to have that. That if we spend a little bit too much time, and this is understandable, right? Again, this is our mind trying to protect yourself and be there for yourself. But if we spend too much time feeling preoccupied, worried, and anxious and nervous about getting the call, being ready for the call, it's that hurry up and wait feeling that tends to persist. And to our point, we do have some time. And I also say that in order for us to kind of have other good outcomes when it comes to our cardiovascular health, loneliness is a big issue, right? We know that emotional health factors can be really important for us to address. So in a way, visiting the kids, going up to the cabin, right, some of these things, is not only important for our emotional health, but it's actually important for our physical health too. Knowing that sometimes our mental health can manifest in physical ways. And so framing what we're doing in a lot of ways can be helpful, right? We're not doing something that could be potentially risky. We're actually doing something that's really important for your health and well-being by finding doing things you enjoy, doing those leisure activities, finding time for rest and relaxation, connecting with the people that are most important to you. Uh, the people you share your good days and bad days with. Um, Great. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And thank you both. Um, and uh, if we don't have any other questions, we'll kind of start to wrap up here. Um, I want to thank both of our presenters today. Uh, d- very insightful uh, things that you both had to share. Um, as a reminder, we will have this up for streaming in about a week on the Second Chance for Life website. Um, and then a, one other quick reminder, our next session is in two weeks from today at noon, uh, where we'll be talking specifically about VAD and destination therapy. Dr. Maharaj uh, will be sharing uh, some medical insights on that, as well as then Michael Finch on the palliative uh, side of talk about you know aging through this, because folks are doing so well on, on uh, VADs these days. So anyway, thank you all for attending, and especially thank you both for uh, presenting as well. Have a wonderful day. Bye, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.